Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. This is um, Carrie from the Buttonwood Park Zoo in Massa New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, we hope you're all having a lovely uh, beginning to your week. As you can see, we are doing something a little different again today. Hi, Hannah and Mackenzie. Hi, Beth. <laughs> we know Beth. <laughs> we know Hannah and Mackenzie. We're just going to let a few more people hop on. Hi, Cindy. Good morning. Happy Monday. You are here with uh, Carrie and Miss Sarah. We are part of our education team here at the zoo. Hopefully, you can see our beautiful sphere in front of you showing um, our beautiful blue marble or earth. Um, we're just going to let a few more people hop on before we get started. But um, we are certainly experiencing similar to everybody else it's just such a weird time and we are missing all of our field trip buddies this time of year this is the month when we would be literally having thousands of children and their teachers joining us for field trips and we are sorely missing um, that opportunity to connect with all those kids and so we are super grateful to be able to do this virtually with you this morning and that's why we decided to do our science on a sphere again um, today we're going to kind of feature one of our more popular field trip topics which is water and just how incredible um, our water system is here and i don't want to give too much away because miss sarah is actually going to be doing our presentation um, but i do want to just share with you in case you're new to science on a sphere what you're looking at on your screen is a giant six foot globe um, it is an actual big ping pong ball, so it's not a hologram. It is um, a big hollow globe that we were able to put up. Science on a Sphere was designed by NOAA as a way to really help people visualize global and even astronomical sized things like the water cycle and weather and ocean currents and things like that. And so this is an awesome ed educational tool for us that we're able to use both with our visitors and our field trip buddies um, to really teach systems and um, lots of cool stuff. So when you're looking at the sphere today, we're actually looking at satellite images taken from space. So this isn't a cartoon or a drawing of Earth. This is actually what she looks like from space, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and then what they're able to do with Science on the Sphere is actually put data on top of our satellite images. So Miss Sarah is going to be taking us through some interesting data that we're able to draw from satellite images. So I'm going to turn it over to Miss Sarah who's going to be talking to you about um, water and then <laughs> as always we can take questions and requests from the audience afterwards but again this is going to be a little different. Pretend you're on a field trip to the Buttonwood Park Zoo with us today or with your educator Miss Sarah and Miss Carrie um, and we're going to do a presentation and then take questions at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. All right good morning everyone Sarah here. And I hope you're already enjoying a lovely view of our science on a sphere. As you take a look at the satellite images that we've got here, you can see that there are a lot of really interesting colors on Earth. But I'm guessing, as you look right now at the massive Pacific Ocean, that your first color you're noticing is probably blue. And the water that we have on this planet is arguably the thing that makes us the most special in the universe, as far as we know. And it's because the way that Earth is built and the fact that we can have water in all three phases, it's something that as of right now could potentially be unique to us. We've never found another planetary body that has that. So we're going to talk a lot about the really cool things that water does for us. And of course, the first thing that we always talk about is the fact that it is why we can have life. So as you take a look, let's start off by looking again at that bright blue. So that blue that you're noticing is all the liquid water that we have on Earth. You've probably played around with it, but there are a lot of other things that you do in it besides swim. So take a second to think of some of the ways that you've, you've used water today, yesterday, this week, this month. You can probably think of a lot of things. Hopefully you've been doing a lot of hand washing. So we certainly use liquid water to wash our hands, to wash our bodies, to clean our clothes and our dishes and all sorts of things like that. But we also use it to give to our plants and animals. If you've got plants in your house or pets that you like to take care of, you're giving them water as well. You might even use it to cook. Maybe if you've made pasta or coffee or something like that today, you've used water in a lot of different ways. So liquid water is super important. 
But if you think about it, we're not using salt water to do all of those things. We're using fresh water. So if you look at our blue marble here, all that blue that you're seeing, those are the oceans. And that's salt water, which is not what we're using every single day in our homes. So I want you to take a second to imagine all of the Earth's water. We need to try and figure out how much of it is that salt water that we see, and how much is the fresh water that we actually use. So we're gonna take a second to think about percents. Now imagine that you had 100 pennies in front of you and each penny represented 1% of Earth's water. How would you divide your pennies if I asked you to show me how much of our water was salt water and how much was fresh water? So a lot of times people give it the nice half and half. That would be fantastic. It's not quite that, so take a second and just imagine looking at all that beautiful blue we have on our globe here. If you had 100 pennies, 97 of them would be in your saltwater pile, and only three would be in your freshwater pile. And in fact, even then, it would only be about two and a half. And of that very small amount of fresh water, a lot of it's not in places that we can use. It's either underground, or it's in far away streams and lakes and rivers, or even frozen. So once we jump back to our beautiful science on a sphere, blue is not the only color that you see. Our liquid water is in some places covered up by the color white. And those big swirls of white represent clouds. Water vapor is a different phase that we have of water. It's the gas form and it's all around us. So if you take a second to imagine that you're surrounded by water, I can prove it to you. Hold your hand in front of your mouth and breathe out. You should be able to feel some hot moisture on your hand. And believe it or not, that is water vapor. And it's condensing onto your hand. But that's just a little bit of proof that water is all around us. When enough of it comes together and it condenses together in the sky, those are our clouds. And when they build up enough water molecules, eventually they'll rain down fresh water onto the earth. So it's pretty important too that we have water in our atmosphere or up in the sky because believe it or not, even though it sounds kind of crazy, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. So maybe you've heard the terms global climate change or global warming thrown around. And we like to think of those greenhouse gases as a nice big blanket laying on top of the earth. We need that blanket there. Without it, we would be absolutely frozen. All that blue that you see in the oceans, that would be ice. We wouldn't be able to drink it or use it to water plants or anything like that. So we need those greenhouse gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and even nitrous oxide. But imagine it's a beautiful summer day and you've got a huge thick blanket on. Even though you do need that blanket sometimes, if it's too big and too thick, things can get a little bit too warm. Now the real problem with it getting a bit too warm is actually the other part of our globe that looks white. So I'm gonna take a second to rotate our science on a sphere to show you something a little different. Can you see it? All right, so that nice white patch in the middle is the same color as clouds, but that's actually an ice cap. So we're looking right now at the North Pole. And what's absolutely amazing about the North Pole is that there's not actually any land there. That whole patch of ice is all floating on top of the ocean. And so if it were to melt, all the animals that live on that as if it were land would have a bit of a problem in terms of having to swim basically forever or having to move further south. If you want to compare that to the other side of the planet, let's see if I can bring this around. Nope, that's still the North Pole. You know what, guys? I apologize. We're going to try this again. Let's see. There we go. That's more like it. Here we're looking at the South Pole. And the South Pole happens to fall on a continent called Antarctica. And what's absolutely incredible about this is that this one actually is a continent. So even if all that ice were to melt, you would still have a huge landmass there. Lucky for us though, and especially lucky for all the penguins that live there, it's still got a nice coating of ice on it. But we need to do a lot to make sure that we keep it there because so many animals rely on it. All right, so we've talked about our water. We've talked about our vapor to give you another cool look at what vapor looks like. Here's some of those data sets that Carrie was talking about. 
You can see this data is coming if you look at the timestamp from late April. So this is very recent. And you can just see the outline of the continents there. You can see the way that the vapor moves around. So even though you can't see it in the sky, it is always there. And anytime you miss it, just breathe into your hand and you can prove it to yourself. So we've talked about liquid water, we've talked about vapor water, and we've talked about solid water. So let's take a second to see one of my very favorite images. This is called the bathial drain. So imagine that the earth is a giant bathtub and you've pulled the plug on it, letting all the water drain out. This is what we're seeing right now. All of the water is going to drain out slowly. It's gonna leave the shallowest places first, and then it's going to have only the deepest parts of the world left. I just think this is a really cool image because it shows you the deepest, deepest places. Take a second to imagine where you think the deepest part of the ocean might be. And then we'll see if we can find the place that drains last. <laughs> what do we think? I'm going to rotate it just a little bit more until we find it. Now look, again, this is the Pacific Ocean. Just imagine that entire area is all water. It's pretty crazy. I'm going to try and give you the best possible view. Hopefully you can see in the camera. Someone is saying the Marina Trench. Amazing, all right, and if you take a close <laughs> look, we'll watch it one more time, you can see the Mariana Trench is in fact absolutely the last place. It is the deepest place we know of on Earth, Challenger Deep. And if you watch right in the center there, you'll see that ridge that is the last place to drain. So we're gonna have to use our imaginations for just a second here. I want you to imagine that all this water is draining off and then I can put it into its own sphere, right next to the science on a sphere. If we kept this to scale and drained all that water off, all the water would fit into the size of a volleyball. Now that's 100% of Earth's water. Now I need you to take your hands from a volleyball size down to a baseball size. Imagine holding a baseball. Of all that water we just talked about, only about a baseball is going to actually be fresh water. But remember, a lot of that fresh water is not usable to us. So that's not gonna do it either. I need you to take your hands and make the size of a golf ball. Unfortunately, that golf ball sized amount of fresh water is trapped in ice caps at the North and South Pole. Again, unusable to us and eventually melting into salt water and therefore no longer fresh water. Now I need you to make your hand the size of a bouncy ball, nice and small. Now that water is going to be in streams and lakes and rivers, which again is wonderful and it is kind of accessible, but if those are pretty far away, not as handy. We're getting a lot of our water from underground aquifers. And if we really stop and think about the amount of water that we can use every day to do the things that we need, like drink it, clean ourselves with it, cook food with it, give it to our plants and animals, you need to make your hands the size of a marble. So that tiny blue marble is the amount of water that we have to use on a daily basis. It makes up 0.03% of the Earth's water. It's an incredibly small amount. Now I don't want you to be too scared because the Earth is incredible at recycling this water. It evaporates water up from the oceans and puts it into the air and then it rains down again as fresh water. There are all sorts of ways that Earth gives us back our fresh water once we use it. The problem is if we use it too quickly, that's when we get into a bit of a conundrum. Where's all this fresh water we need? To give you an idea of just how much we use, if you're wearing jeans right now, stop and take a second to imagine how much water it took to make those. They're made out of cotton and they have to be transported and they need to be created using machines. On average, a pair of adult-sized jeans takes 1,800 gallons of fresh water to make. That's pretty crazy. So before I open up to any questions, I want you to take a second to think about all the cool things that we can do in our daily lives to protect the amount of fresh water that we have. Some of the things that you can do are you can buy fewer clothes. Make the ones that you have last as long as possible. And then if you want, buy reused clothes when you need something new. 
You can make sure that you turn the water off while you're brushing your teeth or take shorter showers. And if you have a pool, you can cover it up during the hot summer days so that nothing's going to evaporate out of it and you'll have to refill it. All of these are little things that we can do to make sure that we help the earth protect the amount of fresh water that we have. It's one of the things that makes us as incredibly special as we are. We are a Goldilocks planet. We're just close enough to the sun that we can have liquid water and water vapor. We're just far enough away that we can still have solid water or ice. And like I said, we are the only planetary body that we know of right now that has a stable source of liquid, solid, and gas water. So we are pretty incredible. All right, now cool. if there are any questions, I'd love to take them. Yeah, and I wanna just add, because this is my favorite thing, when I'm talking to kids about water, as Miss Sarah said, the water cycle is a, it just continues to go around and around. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is when you buy like a bottle of water, mm -hmm. they don't make that water in the factory. The water that we have on earth is the water that's been on earth since the beginning of time. It just goes around and around in that cycle. And so my favorite thing to tell kids is that when you're drinking a glass of water at <laughs> one time, it may have been drunk by a dinosaur. It could have been um, in a medieval, soldier's body and um, so it's pretty cool and pretty amazing to think that we use the same water over and over again and that's why it's so incredibly precious we can't make it in a factory um, and so I just wanted to add a little <laughs> funny thing like I that. love it we did have some people I, I want to um, say that we had a question come in about um, how there are parts of the planet although our we have a blue bu big beautiful blue planet mm -hmm. there are parts of the world that are fairly scarce of water and how do animals and plants survive without a lot of water in those like there are parts when we met Cairo the fennec fox we learned that there are parts of the Sahara Desert that it doesn't rain for years absolutely and so that's a great thing too because I know we talked about our blue color and our white color our green color is all those plants that we know need water because we have to water plants but there is a bunch of land that we see that's either that kind of sandy beige that's creeping up or even a darker red and those patches are areas without a lot of plants and without a lot of water. So it can be really difficult for plants and animals to survive, which is where this beautiful process of evolution comes in where we have adaptations to help those animals to survive. So for example, think of plants like cacti. A cactus does not need nearly as much water as a normal plant. That thick skin that it has prevents water from evaporating out super easily, and it helps seal it in almost like a giant plant thermos. Now some animals take advantage of that same adaptation. They've learned to break into cacti and drink the water from inside that cactus plant. So all sorts of plants and animals have come up with crazy ways, either from collecting morning dew to digging deep underground or to sharing very rare and precious watering holes when they come up after a rain. Some of them even have crazy migrations like you saw in our extreme parent Zucru, where they have to fly for miles, birds, fill up their feathers and then they fly all the way back just to give them to their babies. So there are some pretty crazy ways that animals survive in deserts, but believe you me, they are still using water. However crazy and creative it might be to get it, they are still using it. Right, every bit of living life on earth requires water Absolutely. in some way. Awesome, we had um, three donations come in, so I want to give a huge thank you to those of you who donated. Your names have whizzed by me, so I'm, I can't give you a direct shout out, um, but thank you so much for your donations during this time of closure when we can't have our field trip buddies here. Um, we aren't able to bring in revenue, but we do wanna keep connecting with you virtually, so we really appreciate your support. I do wanna give a plug that tomorrow is Giving Zoo Day, and we have until tomorrow to raise $30,000 um, towards a matching donation. So every little bit counts, even $5, $1, it all will go towards our goal for tomorrow, so we really appreciate that. Chris, thank you so much for noticing our enthusiasm and information that we give <laughs> out. We are super lucky to have really talented um, educators like Sarah who work here and um, can provide that for us. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. If you have any questions for Sarah about water on earth um, and anything you'd like to see on the sphere, we're happy to take those questions. I'll give you one more minute. Anything else you wanna show us? Any other Sure, well I've things? also got some fun facts that I would love to tell you about. Cool. So for example, when we talk about uh, all these fun here, I'll go to the earth in real time so you can see some more data. 
We talk about how little fresh water there is, but there are a couple places where there's an absolute ton of it. Oh, maybe this wasn't a good idea because it's been a little bit stormy, so you can't really see it. Let's go back <laughs> to Blue Marble. If you take a look, we're gonna zoom over to the Great Lakes. Oh man, so many clouds. I know there's one that doesn't have clouds on it. <laughs> My apologies, friends. Point being, I will find it. <laughs> and there are the Great Lakes in the United States of America, which have about a fifth of the fresh water in the entire world, which I think is absolutely insane. And I love that fun fact. But not to be outdone, there is also a set of Great Lakes in Africa, which has about a quarter of the fresh water in the world. So we've got a, we've got a little competition. Oh, well, I'm still not being able to find it, unfortunately. Miss Carrie's gonna help me out. There's one that has no clouds. Yes. There we go. All right, <laughs> so let's see if we can find those. All right. So again, in those shallower places, you can see some of that nice blue water right there, though, in the United States as I make this turn all sorts of crazy ways. You can see those very strange looking lakes right there in the middle. Okay, I was I'm just trying to stop it. There you go. Oh, all right. I was going to oh, say it's that. Gary. I made it worse. I'm sorry. Reset, reset. All right. Well, Carrie's taking over there. with this one, but I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit more. So if you look in North America, you can see those big lakes in the middle. Again, those have about a fifth of our fresh water on the planet. And then if you go over to Africa, you can also see the African Great Lakes. Oh, we are just twisted and turned all around. There we go. You can also see those large lakes as well. So that's about a quarter. Now, we like to say kind of flippantly that we're the only place with liquid water in the entire universe. And that's not quite true. We have the only really stable surface level oceans that we know of, but there are places even in our solar system that have liquid water that we're aware of. A lot of them though aren't planets, they're actually moons of planets. So for example, if we take Jupiter, which is our biggest planet, and it has its biggest moon, a moon so big that it's actually bigger than Mercury, um, it's got two moons, let's see if I can remember their names, Europa and Ganymede, are two moons in Jupiter that actually are almost definitely holding below surface oceans that hopefully we can explore someday if we find a way to do that. Science is always evolving and it's gonna be an exciting time. Saturn also has one. So Saturn has one, oh gosh, saying things is difficult. Oh, I shouldn't have built myself up for that one. But there's a really cool Enceladus, that's it. Enceladus is a moon from Saturn. It's absolutely massive. It's right inside those rings. And it also is almost definitely holding a subterranean or an under earth ocean. So. There are places even quite nearby that have liquid water, but we're the only one that we know that has liquid, solid, and gas all at the same time. We have some good questions coming in about yep. the human body and water. What percentage of a human body is water, and are eyes made from water? Oh man, our bodies have an absolute <laughs> ton of water inside them. So if you stop and think for a second that we have, I wanna say around 37 or 38 trillion cells in our body, and every single one of them has water in them. Our eyes, our skin, our organs. I mean, every single cell has to have water in it. So it's a really, really important part of us. And if we obviously didn't drink a lot of water at some point, that would be a really negative experience for us because our body needs it to function. So I'm blanking on an exact percentage. <laughs> I want to say like 80%, but I don't know if it's that's It's a lot. Right. That would be an excellent thing for you to do this afternoon to research that. that. Not, not to Miss Sarah, but to our visitor, visitors <laughs> in the that. audience. Um, Compare that even though to something like a jelly. You might know them as a jellyfish. And a lot of those can be up to 98 or 99% water. And that's just incredible. So a lot of animals, every single animal really, needs water to survive. We had a question from Trinity Heaven, age 7. How do volcanoes affect the water they are in? Oh, that's very interesting. Well, believe it or not, a lot of volcanoes happen below the surface of the ocean. And what happens then is actually the creation of a new island. So all around the world, and hopefully you can see a few of the bigger ones, you can see these islands dotting the surface in the oceans. And every day we have new islands coming into existence because of underwater volcanoes. So I'm, I'm sure you're wondering about whether or not that's gonna put lots of nasty stuff into the water. And 
In a certain way it does, but those are natural materials and they're gonna be cycled through the ocean the same way that every other natural material is. So either they'll sink to the bottom, some of them might actually get eaten by other animals, some of them will go to the surface of the islands, um, but that's always gonna kind of come back. A lot of what comes out of volcanoes is gonna be carbon in some form or other, and that's a really important part of its own cycle, the carbon cycle. And so it's definitely going to have its place settling on the ground, going back into the water, any sorts of places. So that's a wonderful question, I'm very impressed, well done. And Those are all over Kino. <laughs> and then just, I just found a data set. Um, all the little green triangles that you see are volcanoes. So that just shows you where all the volcanoes are located on Earth. And we will be doing a different Science on a Sphere presentation at a later date where we just focus on natural disasters like volcanoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and all those good things. Like the Ring of Fire where we have this crazy pattern where volcanoes show up along these fault lines and you can just see they go in a crazy line all the way down that coast. So you'll see all sorts of cool patterns when you look at where volcanoes are in the world. And you'll notice that a bunch of them are in the middle of the ocean. All right, and then thank you, Shane, who um, has done our research for us. Um, the human body is about 62% water. Thank you so much, Shane, 62%. That's pretty cool. More <laughs> than half, I love it. All Learning right. Learning is fun. <laughs> Well, we want to thank you guys so much for joining us today for our virtual Keeper Chat. Thank you to the additional donations that rolled in. Those will go to help us towards our goal of $30,000 by tomorrow, which is Giving Zoo Day, uh, where we are hoping to meet our goal of $30,000 for our matching donation from an anonymous donor. But um, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed your virtual field trip today. This was an opportunity for us to do one of our favorite things that we should be doing this time of year, which is welcoming lots of kids in to learn about these things in our classrooms. So um, thanks for spending a little bit of time this morning with us. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back again tomorrow for another edition of Virtual Keeper Chats. Thank you, Miss Sarah, for teaching us all about water. Thank you I loved it. Um, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.